What's up? What's happening? Welcome here to Lacrosse Now. Travis Eldridge back this week. Got a couple of terrific guests joining us uh, this week. We'll talk with Penn State head coach Jeff Tambroni. We continue to look ahead to the 2023 season, which is now just about a month away. So exciting times as uh, college lacrosse teams here in the next couple of weeks will start returning to campus. So we'll talk with Jeff Tambroni about Penn State's 2023 outlook. We'll also look back at what was a really memorable 2021 season with tr former Drexel Dragon Carson Harris. She was part of that Drexel team that w was nearly won a CAA tournament championship uh, that year, one of the, the great years in Drexel women's lacrosse history. So we'll look back uh, with Carson Harris on 2021. But before we get to all of that, I, I thought it was important to talk about the DeMar Hamlin situation because I, I don't think anybody can talk about sports here today after what we witnessed on Monday Night Football with the Bills um, safety and, and not mention him. So we're, we're going to talk about that real quick and, and then we'll get to some lacrosse stuff like I just mentioned. But Anybody who witnessed that and now clearly has seen the reaction that's outpoured both on, on social media and in the media and, and throughout the, the sports community for DeMar Hamlin knows what happened where he went into cardiac arrest after a hit last night uh, against the Cincinnati Bengals on Monday Night Football during the first quarter. And we're learning now that CPR had to be administered for several minutes on the field before he was eventually taken to a hospital where he's currently, as, as we tape this here on Tuesday, can, continues to be in critical condition. And I, I thought it was important. Obviously, it's, it's heartbreaking for, for DeMar and his family and the, the whole Bills organization and, and really the entire NFL community to, to watch and, and wait and pray. And our prayers continue to go out to, to everyone involved. But I thought it was important to emphasize and use this moment to understand how important it is for people in lacrosse to know that this could happen there too, and, and how important it is to understand what cardiac arrest is and how it can be treated, whether it's with uh, the use of an AED or through CPR like we saw last night, because this story and, and watching things unfold last night made me think of some of the situations I've heard across the lacrosse community of moments where because of a ball hitting the wrong part of a chest or a stick colliding with somebody during a game, that this happens in the sport that we love so much here, the, the sport of lacrosse, and how important it can be to have an AED on site and people who know how to administer CPR there to be able to quickly help someone who is in need. I, the, the story of John Mack, who is a Binghamton High School student back in 2006, who tragically lost his life because of this similar situation where it took a while for an AED to get to the field and it wasn't there quick enough for him to be able to, to be revived. And the John Mack Foundation for years in southern, the Southern Tier of New York has helped raise money to purchase AEDs for communities and clubs and, and fields uh, in order to make sure that they are there. God forbid something happens on location or at a school or at a facility and so I, I think as we continue to send our prayers to Damar Hamlin I think it's important that if you're a coach if you're an organization if you help run a facility make sure that this is a good time to maybe check in on all those devices make sure that if you're supposed to be up on your CPR make sure you are if, if even if you're not make sure that Maybe if you're at a lacrosse tournament out, out in the field somewhere in a big group, maybe you can be someone who could help somebody in need. So I, I think it's a, it's a good moment to remember how important those things are because without them, I don't know if DeMar Hamlin has a chance. And at least right now, we feel like he has a chance and we continue to say our prayers because the NFL had the resources and everything in place to be able to try to treat this awful situation. So if if that same same situation happens in a youth lacrosse tournament in a men's league game somewhere in the evenings, are we ready? Um, and so that, it's just something that uh, I was thinking about from stories I remember hearing in this lacrosse community and how similar things have happened in our sport and um, just made me think of, of that when I was watching everything unfold last night. So I thought that that would be an important way uh, to start lacrosse now here. So we continue to hope and pray for DeMar Hamlin that he's going to be okay because um, 
It's really hard to watch on national TV last night. Uh, so prayers to him, his family, that the whole Bills organization. Uh, if you're, but but once again, if you're coach, parent, player, facility owner, just make sure you're prepared. God forbid something like this um, happens in front of you in a game you're at or watching or part of. So um, there's no easy way to transition from that, but we're going to start. We'll talk a little bit uh, about lacrosse now uh, as we continue to send our prayers um, out there to the DeMar Hamlin family and, and to him. Make sure he's OK. Um, so we did have some lacrosse this past weekend. The uh, National Lacrosse League picking things up after a week off uh, around the Christmas holiday. So uh, we had three games this past weekend. A couple of thoughts, two games that really stood out to me in watching things. It was the Buffalo and San Diego wins, both of them flexing their muscles offensively from what we saw. Bandits beat Halifax 18-13, seven goal, 12-point day from Josh Byrne. Dane Smith had 10 points in that game. Not often that he's going to be overshadowed by anybody on his own team when he does that, but seven goals on 11 shots for Josh Byrne. Just incredibly efficient, 12 points overall. Tell you what, Josh Byrne is, I mean, he's been a star now for a number of years. Really start starting to feel like he's coming into his own in the NLL as a guy who can take over games. If that's the case, you add that to what Dane Smith has done now for multiple years as an MVP candidate and MVP in this league, look out for Buffalo. So Josh Byrne, big day, big win uh, for the Bandits. San Diego with an impressive win over Calgary. They hang 17 goals on the Roughnecks. This may be a bit of a redemption game. Yeah, Dane Doby, Curtis Dixon combined for 17 points against their former team. The two of them, of course, were stars for Calgary for a number of years, now joining forces in San Diego. And uh, the, <coughs> that San Diego team, the Seals, look like they are probably the team to beat out west, at least here in the early going. They prove it again. They're now 3-0. So a couple of things to point out from this past week. And now we're going to look ahead. So I'm going to give you... Three things that I think you should watch this weekend in the NLO. There's a bunch of games, so I'm trying to narrow it down. If there are three things to watch for, this is what I think you should keep an eye on this weekend. Number one, can Las Vegas get their first win in franchise history? They play against Philly at home on Friday night out in the Sin City. Wings are giving up 15 goals per game. That has been a struggle spot for Las Vegas here in their first two. They just haven't been able to generate a ton of offense. They're only averaging about seven goals a game. So the Wings defense hasn't been great. Can Las Vegas generate a little bit more against Philadelphia here this week? Maybe give themselves a chance. So I think that uh, helps. It's a young, inexperienced Las Vegas team. they got a lot of guys on there that are at, being asked to do a lot of different things. This is a Feels like a very true expansion team. We've seen some of the teams in the past where they're like a San Diego that came in. They were ready to compete right away. I think Las Vegas is going to take a couple of years with the way in which they've built this roster. So a lot of guys getting some major experience here in the NLL early on. But I think this may be a one, maybe one at home against Philly. Can they against a, a Philly offense or defense has given up a bunch of goals so far. Can they generate enough offense, give themselves a chance? So keep an eye on that game. The other one I really like is in the East, Toronto against New York on Saturday. And that is because the one, the only Jeff Teat. You look at the scoring leaders in the NLL so far this year. Jeff Teat has played in only two games, yet still ranks in the first 15, 20 guys in the league. Because he's averaging nine points per game. He's got 18 total points in two games, despite the fact that New York is 0-2. Jeff Teat and the New York Riptide are must-see TV because this guy is on an absolute tear, and I think it can continue throughout the year. So I have my eyes focused on him versus Tom Schreiber and The Rock. The Rock could also use a win. Toronto 1-2 and two here to start the year. They're a team that people are very high on, along with Tom Schreiber. Challen Rogers has transitioned now to being more of an offensive threat from being a, a transition defender uh, in the early part of his career. So maybe that transition is taking a while, but I think this Toronto team is going to be really good. So this is an important one against a New York team that could be feisty. I'll be interested to see the Jeff T versus Tom Shriver, Shallon Rogers matchup there with Toronto versus New York on Saturday. And then the third thing to watch this weekend in the NLL, Calgary at Colorado on Saturday night. 
Probably the best test for Colorado since that head-scratching loss in the opener against Saskatchewan. Calgary looking to bounce back against San Diego. I think these two teams, along with, uh, along with San Diego, along with Saskatchewan, probably your top four teams in, in the West at, at the moment, and I think probably throughout the year, Important jockeying for early seeding and early standings here between Calgary and Colorado. Also a game on Saturday night. So I got Vegas and Philly one to watch on Friday, then Toronto, New York, and Calgary, Colorado. Conveniently, all of those are at different times. So you can watch all three of them, your three things to watch in the NLL this weekend. So we'll go from indoors to outdoors before we get to head coach of Penn State, Jeff Tambroni. Uh, quickly, the PLL schedule was announced back on New Year's Day, so I want to hit on a couple of things for that before we hear from the Penn State head coach looking ahead to 2023. Uh, things opening up in Albany again, Albany, New York, June 2nd through the 4th, that first weekend of June, once again, will kick off the PLL season. Three locations I love on this schedule. If you want to see the schedule and you haven't already, go to the PLL, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all their different social media uh, pages or their website. But three locations that really intrigue me and I like for some different reasons. One, they're going to Columbus, Ohio uh, this time around, June 16th through the 18th. However, it's not back at the MLS stadium where they played the, the last time they were in Columbus. They're going to be going to the new Ohio State lacrosse stadium that, of course, is getting ready to open. We had Nick Myers uh, on lacrosse now a couple of weeks ago. If you didn't Hear that interview, go back through the uh, archives either on YouTube or on the podcast page uh, to take a listen to that. He's very excited about the new facility that they have uh, that they're unveiling this year for this uh, spring season. Going to be ready in February. They're, they're practicing there in January. Exciting times to be an Ohio State Buckeye lacrosse player fan. We'll, I, I just love the PLO going there so early in the facility's history and because this is a, a, an area in Columbus that really supported the machine. I, I think there are a lot of former machine players, guys like uh, uh, Marcus Holman and uh, Tom Schreiber, that really appreciated having a chance to play for that organization. So I, I think it's going to be really cool to see the PLO go back to Columbus, but this time in a smaller uh cooler facility and you know Ohio State used to do a great job supporting what the machine were doing in Major League Lacrosse you know Ohio State will do the same thing with the PLL so first class facility uh, for lacrosse and having a chance to see the pro guys get a chance to experience that uh, as well is going to be really cool so I like Columbus I also like going back to the Ford Center in Frisco Texas the star of the Cowboys practice facility down there I've just I've been lucky enough to see an MLL championship down there, had a chance to call a couple of games down there, and it just it feels like such a perfect venue for the sport. The size is right, the atmosphere is good, the the stands are pretty close to the field, so fans can feel like they're up close and personal. The location in terms of the lead up, you've got that big turf field that looks like a, the Cowboys field that, that lines right up to the entrance of the, the field. So you got the Fan Fest out there, great restaurants and bars, great atmosphere around the facility. So just everything that the PLL wants in a facility is there. So I, I really I, I love them going back there uh, for the second year in a row. And then the, the final location that I'm pumped about is, is the championship back in Philadelphia. It, I mean, look, Philadelphia is near and dear to my heart growing up outside the city. So I know how much sports means to that community. But the community and the lacrosse community around has really supported the PLL championship coming there. Like the atmospheres for the couple of championships we've seen in Philadelphia here in the PLL's history have been awesome. And so I, I think rewarding that stadium and the, the community by going back there for another championship, I think is fitting because they've gotten great attendance, great atmosphere, great games there, uh, great weather toward the middle to end of September. So uh, Philadelphia for the championship seems, uh, seems like the right thing again. So there are my uh, three locations that I love the PLL is going back to here this year. Once again, you can see that full list up on the uh, the social media for the Premier Lacrosse League, but those are the three that really intrigued me. Uh, speaking of Pennsylvania, let's uh, go up to Central PA. Had a chance to catch up with Penn State head coach Jeff Tambroni uh, a couple of weeks ago as we look ahead to the 2023 season. Why don't you listen in as the Nittany Lions are looking to bounce back after a rocky 2022. So as we continue to get ready for 2023, we've got Penn State head coach Jeff Tambroni joining us now. Um, coach, 
I'll, I'll just start it off. We're talking here in early December. Like, where, where do you feel like this team's at coming out of the fall? I think it's grown significantly. Um, I think there's a lot of optimism here. And, you know, we've gone through a couple of challenging years. So I don't think there's any mystery in that. Um, we've had to deal with a ton of adversity. And I think health was our number one priority coming back uh, this, this past fall. I and mean, we worked really hard to get back to our roots and uh, trying to assimilate. We got 17 new guys on this year's team. We did um, – end up getting a couple guys from the transfer portal, which we just have not um, exercised over the last couple of years, but we got some, some really good culture guys who are also helping um, on field. So I would say through the development of that chemistry, um, kind of reestablishing the culture of our program this fall, we got some guys that are healthy now and, and playing and competing at a, at a higher level. Um, there's optimism coming in after our, our uh, fall season and great excitement to get these guys to go home over the, the winter session and come back and get the 2023 season underway. But you mentioned the struggles, and obviously it's been a, a couple of a tough years, especially when you look at the record. What do, you, what do you take away and what do you learn from that, especially coming off of the years that you guys had, which were like landmark and program history? What do you take away from the last couple? Yeah, winning's just not easy. I, mean, I think it, 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 the moment you take a, a – a breath or step back and uh, take a pause. Somebody else is going to go out there and they're going to pass you. I mean, there's so much competition um, in division one lacrosse with, with so few teams, um, you know, the, the, the competitive nature of recruiting, the competitive nature of the transfer portal, you know, between COVID and the transfer portal, the landscape of college lacrosse, especially in division one changed so drastically and so quickly Um so I think my my takeaway is we probably didn't react quick enough or or appropriately enough over the last couple of years philosophically and um, but I think we're we're in a, a decent place and trajectory now and you gotta you gotta blend what you believe in in terms of your own coaching staff or philosophy and at the same time you got to adapt to the changes that are going on in this world and there's a lot of them and they keep happening keep changing so um, I, I got to do a better job of of the the leader of this team of just making sure that we're staying more a step ahead versus a step behind of some of those changes that have occurred in the last couple of years. You mentioned bringing guys in, whether it's recruiting or through the transfer portal, were there like pieces that you felt like you guys didn't quite have in the last couple of years? And do you feel like you have answers as you enter this season? It's a great question. I, I, I just think it comes down to just maturity. You know, if you're, if you're recruiting at the top versus recruiting, you know, and, and these guys matriculate as freshmen. It is, it's such a drastic difference to bring someone in. There's great enjoyment in bringing someone in from a senior year of high school and introducing your culture and watching them develop and grow and um, living through and learning some mistakes together so that they can be better prepared for the following year. And then eventually for life that, that is that's the mission of why I got into this. This is why I do what I do. And this goes back to my, my old high school coach, Mike Masser back in uh, Camillus, New York. But at the end of the day, when it comes to just winning and competing, if you get a fifth year who's 22 or 23 years old, who's already had that experience and he can bring a championship level or a higher level of thinking or of preparing um, or a maturity to the table, it's, instantaneous opportunities of success. And if you don't have that blend or don't at least um, dip into that, that world, uh, unless you're recruiting over the last four years has just been a lead to every year, then it becomes really challenging to compete against the teams that are out there doing it and doing it really well. So I think that that blend is important to, to navigate, at least in our opinion. And I think we're doing it better now than we were in the first couple of years. But I think it's ever changing, so we got to just just recognize we got to we got to keep up with it. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and you know, I think I, I look at your roster too, and, and, and you guys, it's not like you guys don't have talent there. There's there's talent there. You've been recruiting at a high level. I look at guys like Will Pedden and Matt Costin. Like, what have you seen from them where you feel like maybe they, as some of your top returning scores, maybe can take that next step? Like, what are the things that you work on on that end of the field with, especially guys like that? Yeah. And I think that's the key, like the meat 
of our our team right now is returning guys. We have a couple of really, I think, going to be some key contributors that are coming in through the transfer portal, but we have the meat of our team and it needs to be. It needs to be your 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 core guys, your culture guys. And, you know, there's such a significant, we talked about this, um, you know, in a, in a previous interview about Grant Ament and Mac O'Keefe, they come in as freshmen. The amount of, of growth that you go from freshman to sophomore year is so significant. And we had a ton of freshmen play for us this year. So the combination of some guys that were hurt over the last couple of years, like TJ Malone and Jack Trainer giving those guys an opportunity to come back if healthy would be a huge boost for us. But you got some some terrific um, first-year guys or first- or second-year guys like Mac, Costin, Will, um, Ethan Long, Kevin Parnum, uh, Jack Frasione, Pup Buno, some of these guys that played a lot for us as freshmen. But when you're playing freshmen up against seniors or fifth years, especially in the Big Ten, you're going to take your lumps. Uh, these guys have come back calloused um hungry and uh and prepared and i think that's the key i think over time it's part of the process and sometimes when you've had the opportunity to be at that end you come back with much greater perspective and hunger on what it takes to get back there and that's what we're hoping that we'll just continue to keep learning from our story and just do a better job each year building on it I love the term calloused. I, I don't know if there's a more perfect way to describe like the the bumps in the road and then like you you because it takes time to like build that up, but then it gets tough and then you then you're able to, to you know use that adversity to your advantage because like you're not gonna get a blister again. I think that's a perfect term. Yeah. I mean, we talk to our guys a lot about this. Like we all have scars in our lives, whether it's losses, disappointments, and uh, we, we need to be proud of our scars, uh, but we need to just change. We need to change and adapt if we want those to change or to not keep replicating those same things um, within our program. So I think we've gone through a lot of them over the last couple of years, um, both both good and bad. But I think this group has learned a lot from what has gone on over the last couple of uh, seasons. And I, I, there's there's optimism and hope because uh, we have taken the time to, to reflect back and learn. And I'm optimistic that these guys will come out in 23 and, and play to a really high level. What's the goalie battle look like as you guys enter the spring? Two just absolutely wonderful young men. So I, I love the character that we have back in goal and um it's a unique personality as i'm sure you know like when it comes to the goalie position in and of itself but i love the young men that we have representing us there in particular jack frasion alaric fayak they they have been just just wonderful teammates um super complimentary of each other they compete hard every day i mean they compete hard against each other every day um, but they're super supportive of each other in their efforts. They're they're often found providing pointers of why certain things would go on instead of just trying to um, steal the other's position. They're complementary in their their approach and feedback. So <clears throat> I think both have done a really good job, and both have probably put themselves in the mix of of claiming that starting position we've often thought about the blend of playing both of them um first half second half it's a tough one for a goalie position but i think both of them have proved uh to be in a position to help us so it, it'll be a it, it's a good i guess not problem but good decision to have to work out through the course of the winter session and as we go in there i think a lot will be determined in our in our scrimmages against army and bucknell before we start our first game against lafayette so uh, I want to finish on a, a slightly a different note here. Uh, a couple years ago, we were when uh, we had a chance to do your game against Denver that we talked about for the the Big Ten watch party. Uh, I we I was connecting from Boston to Baltimore. You guys were going from State College to Baltimore. We ended up on the same plan plane, and we sat next to each other on a Southwest flight just randomly before we uh, before we knew it. Uh, and you had a bag of Twizzlers. Are Twizzlers still your your snack for the road? And the, is is that your go to? <laughs> that that's a terrific memory right there that's <laughs> something i i have in my older age I, I i probably have stayed away from from candy now i i i know that the older i get the more challenging it becomes so i've stayed away from it and uh, as much as i possibly can i've tried to trade in the twizzlers for something a little healthier here in my older age yeah so what's the or what's the go-to road trip or, or plane snack now for you that's a good question. I probably don't have a go-to right now, but okay. it would definitely be healthier than a Twizzler right now, <laughs> even though that was a good treat back in the day. That was probably treating myself after a win over Denver. We haven't had a lot of those, so I got to 
I got to build back up to that again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just same for the special trips, the, 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 the good <laughs> ones to celebrate. Uh, <laughs> Coach, we appreciate the time. Can't wait to see you guys uh, back in action this spring. Good luck uh, this winter, and we'll, uh, we'll talk here soon. Great, Travis. Thanks for having me. So a big thanks to head coach Jeff Tambroni from Penn State. Uh, looking forward to seeing the Nittany Lions back in action and uh, kind of bummed that he's not a Twizzler guy anymore on the road. But, I mean, maybe after a, a big win if they, they play Ohio State, big win against Ohio State or Hopkins or somebody, maybe maybe he treats himself to some Twizzlers, Twizzlers or at least some, uh, some ice cream from the creamery there at Penn State. Uh, all right, we continue to look back at some of our favorite past games and moments with Lacrosse TV Watch Party every week. It's Wednesdays here on the network. This week here on Lacrosse Now, we're going to look back at one of the best seasons in Drexel women's lacrosse history. Back in 2021, it was a memorable season, one of the uh, best in terms of wins, NCAA tournament appearance for that Drexel women's program. Had a chance to catch up with former Dragon Carson Harris about that 2021 season. It's an interview that you saw first as part of our Drexel or as part of our CAA women's watch party. Take a listen. This segment of Lacrosse Now is brought to you by Watch Dingo. So we continue the CAA Women's Watch Party with Drexel, former Drexel standout, uh, Carson Harris. Uh, Carson, thanks so much for taking some time. We're going to take you a little trip down memory lane with you, okay? Of course. I'm excited. Thank you for having me. Um, so we're going back to 2021 for you, CAA semifinals against Towson. But I, I just kind of want to set things up. You guys had such a great year, especially in the regular season, kind of a breakout season for you. You're the top seed going into the CAA tournament. What to you stood out about the turnaround you guys had for that, that 2021 season? Um, I think for people to look at it, you look at it and you think it was this one turnaround season, which it was. We obviously our records, but I think for us on the field and us as a team, like we'd felt that coming for a long time. And it was just really nice to have all of our hard work and dedication and like the belief that we'd had in ourselves for so long finally kind of come to fruition and for that to actually pay off for us. Um, so I think that was our the, really the overwhelming feeling was just like pride in ourselves and the fact that we'd kind of pushed this into happening. Um, but at the same time, we looked at each other a hundred times during the season and was like, is this real life? Is this, is this actually happening? What's like, is, am I in a fever dream? Like it was definitely, um, you had two tokens of it part. You a hundred percent believe we, we a hundred percent believe we deserved it. But at the same time, it was something that you never quite expected to actually like come to fruition, which is awesome. Yeah. And you guys are the top seed going into the tournament in a league. That's got James Madison, who obviously is always great and Towson, who traditionally is good. And I mean, there's tons of competition, in the CAA. What did it mean for you guys to be the top seed going into the tournament? Um, honestly, I, I'm not even sure I can give you a full answer to that question because I think that we were we were trying so hard to not focus on the fact that we'd never been the top, like we hadn't been the top seed. We'd never been to that point before. Like I think we were trying so hard to just focus on what we accomplished and not the pressure that that had put on us because clearly we had never been before. Clearly we'd never been the top seed. And I think that was almost more of a stressor than it was anything else. So we tried to kind of just put that out of our mind and like, we've done this before we've played lacrosse before it's the same game we've always played. And I think that's kind of what we try to focus on. So you're trying to focus on that, but before you even play, there's this lengthy lightning delay that just delays <laughs> you guys playing in the semifinal. Like, what, what was that like? What do you remember? Um, I remember duck, duck goose. I, that's what I remember. We literally sat in the, in their indoor turf facility and just had like this incredible time, which I think speaks to exactly what that team was about. And we played duck, duck goose. I think I can't even remember what else we did, but nothing like lacrosse at all. It was all, I just remember looking over and I remember Towson being so stoic and just sitting in a circle, like no one talking to each other. And then you looked at my team and we were running around playing duck, duck goose, like laughing so hard. And I remember being like, we're going to win this game. We, we have this because just of that moment in general. Yeah. I, you know what? I feel like you can learn a lot about a team and like it's makeup by like when you are held like a delay like that, you, there's nothing else you can do. Like you're just stuck. Like you, there's nowhere you're going. There's nothing you can do. You just got to make up something. And like that kind of, the feel probably helps when you guys then get on the field. But, I mean, you get on the field, and it was back and forth throughout. I don't think anybody led by more than two goals the entire game. What was it like to be part of that game and, and how both teams just kind of, like, traded blows the entire game? 
I think I just kept remembering. I just kept trying to tell myself like, this is going to be a game of momentum. Like you have to keep momentum on your side. And obviously we didn't succeed the whole game because it was so back and forth. But I just remember thinking to myself, like every play is going to matter because every it's going to come down to the end. And I think that that's kind of what me and my team just tried to do is like every ground ball that was on the ground was important. Every cause turnover you could get yourself was important. Like I think that because it was such a tight game, it really emphasized all of those small moments that sometimes get overlooked in lacrosse. And that was, I think, honestly, the most fun part for me also of the game, because it was, I, I enjoy pressure situations. So it was a, it was a fun one to be in. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I feel like you either love it or you, you're like, man, this is just so brutal and the nerves, but like, I feel <laughs> like the best players, they want those games because it's like, it brings out the best in you. Right. Yeah. I just, I remember we, after the game, we were like, okay, close one would have been not fun, but was so much fun because, because we ended up winning, like all of us were just like, that was the most fun game of lacrosse we've ever played. And which helped us out in the end, I think. <laughs> the, the final possession of regulation, Towson has it and the 90 second shot clock, I think they got it with like a minute 45 left. So they essentially had like the entire final two minutes and you guys held defensively. What, what's it like mm -hmm. to, to watch that unfold? Um, I think you're sweating. Like <laughs> you are sweating in that moment and you, you can have all the belief in the world and there's still things that can go wrong. And we've like, we've lost an overtime to them. We lost an overtime to them last year. So it's like those moments can happen. And even though I do believe with all of my heart, we were the better team that it, that you, you let one slip and like that can happen. So I think for sure it was, it's definitely nerve racketing, racking, but were we man down in that too? Or am I making that up? No, I think you guys were even okay. strength. But you then go uh, player up there. I think you were up two players by the, the end there when you finally score the, the game winner. What do you remember about that OT game winner and afterward? Honestly, like, I think I blacked out. Um, not much. Like, I remember um, I, I remember Courtney having the ball in the free position and her just getting rocked. Or she, yeah, she got just getting rocked. And um and being like, okay, we can do this again. And it was, I remember being so happy that it was Courtney on that. I mean, I have in my career missed so many free positions for game winners at this point. I was just like, I am so happy Courtney is on this one because she is going to step up. Like, and she deserved it more than anything to have that moment. And at the same time, like that, all of this was going through my head while we're trying to score a goal. I'm like, I'm so happy it's Courtney. Like she totally deserves this. And also like, I know she's going to put it away. And I was so thankful for like that second opportunity that we got for her to finish it. And after that, I just remember like my mouth dropping open and realizing that we'd just like, we were going to the championship for the first time, I think ever. Um, it was a cool moment for sure. Yeah, that's quite the internal dialogue to have. During, yeah, a uh, lot happens in my brain during <laughs> Uh, you mentioned first championship game appearance for the program and obviously it didn't go the way you wanted it to go but just what did that moment mean for Drexel lacrosse what did it mean for you to be a part of it oh I, I was honored to be a part of it we talk about all the time the fact that um my class coming in the me Colleen Lucy Zoe and Claire eventually coming in like I feel so honored to be a part of that class because I think that we really I mean, the entire team did also, but the, those core people, I just feel like really kind of s skyrocketed and just like helped spark this transition in this program. And like, I believe that neither, not a single one of us does it without the other people. Like, I think that that class in general was so strong and I feel so lucky to have been a part of that class. Um, and the ones above me, the fifth years on that team, like they deserve more than anything. I've never met a group of people with so much belief in a program in my life. So I think that it was just really special that that group of people was really special to be with. And I think that I was so proud of us for doing something that was going to go down in history. I think that's what made it the most special is that like now no one can take away the fact that we're the first Drexel women's lacrosse team to go to this like CAA championship. And that's something that will be said. So we deserved as a team to have something that will stay concrete for the rest of Drexel women's lacrosse history. And I think that making it to the CA championship and not having anybody be able to take that away from us is really special. Yeah, it was. And uh, this, the way you did it was special. So uh, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to say thank you to you and let people watch a uh, rewatch that 2021 CAA uh, epic semifinal against Towson. Carson, appreciate the time. Thanks so much and good luck with everything. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. As a reminder, you can watch watch party on lacrosse TV every Wednesday starts at eight 
a.m. Eastern time then starts replaying again at 6 p.m. Eastern time. It's every Wednesday on Lacrosse TV. So uh, make sure you, you take, a, a take a look there. Uh, one more reminder, Lacrosse TV's PBLA Game of the Week this week. Saturday night, Elmira Renegades hosting the Syracuse Spark at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Both teams looking for their first wins in their organization's history. A uh, lot of fun. If you, you missed it last Thursday, go back and check out the uh, YouTube replay of the first PBLA game in the league's history. It was our PBLA game of the week. The Jim Thorpe All-Americans getting the win over the Syracuse Spark. You can re-watch that game on the Lacrosse TV YouTube right now. And then make sure you stay locked into Lacrosse TV next week, 7 p.m. Eastern time here on Saturday, our second PBLA game of the week as that new indoor league is off and running second week of the year coming up here this week. Uh, but that is all the time we have for you here on the cross. Now, once again, thanks to Jeff Tambroni and Carson Harris for taking some time. And uh, we continue to send our prayers to DeMar Hamlin and the entire Bills organization as uh, we continue to wait, hopefully some positive news from that. But we'll leave you with that and we will see you right back here next week.